Dear Mr. President, Excellencies, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome on behalf of Humboldt University. We are delighted and honored to be your host today. In a few minutes, Mr. Barroso will be speaking to us. He will most certainly talk and talk well about the political and social situation in Europe. Already popular around 700, 1700, the idea of Europe gained more and more importance during the 18th century. Back then, Europe was an extremely attractive and viable, yet undefined blank space open for different interpretations. In 1803, Friedrich Schlegel launched a magazine programmatically entitled Europe, which was widely discussed in the intellectual circles of his time. Imagine the following scenario, Friedrich Schiller and Wilhelm von Humboldt sitting around the dining table and discussing ideas about Europe with strong images and opinions in their minds. Schiller repeatedly dealt with the topic of Europe in his poetry as well as in his writings. His poem, An die Freude, To Joy, in later life dismissed by himself as typical of the bad taste of the age, provided the text for the choral movement of Ludwig van Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, which became the European anthem in 1971. This anthem celebrates the common values and ideals of a united Europe, peace, freedom, and solidarity. It expresses the European credo, unity and diversity. Schiller and Europe, a perfect match, Wahlverwandtschaft. There's only one problem. Schiller never actually traveled. In fact, he never left Germany. Therefore, his idea of Europe is an idealized one, and the idea of an actual transnational European community is not presented as such in his writings. The other figure sitting at the table was the founder of our university, Wilhelm von Humboldt. His Berlin University became the role model for many modern universities worldwide. The somewhat utopian idea of launching a university that inscribed freedom as its key concept, the freedom to teach, to conduct research, and to study what one wanted, independent from government interventions, created an, an alliance fruitful for students as well as for professors. Unfortunately, the university has not always been able to remain so free and has not always coped well with the challenges of social and political change. Regarding the academic world, one has to admit that it continuously runs risk to retire from the world and settle comfortably in the ivory tower of science. It seems to be difficult to leave that dining table and focus on real life. Humboldt, this name not only refers to Wilhelm, but also to his brother Alexander. His public lecture series, Cosmos, dealing with his explorations in South America and Russia is a good example of the outreach of academia, a cosmopolitan and globetrotter. This is why the name Humboldt stands for international scientific discourse or even for the idea of global citizenship. After the, wall, after the fall of the wall in 1989, these ideas have resonated as strongly as ever. Not only is Humboldt University one of the most successful German universities in research and reputation, but it is also the center of the German capital, a place where politics and academia meet. We are so glad to host you here today. Thank you. President Barroso, Vice President Kemper van der Borgart, Professor Pernis, Excellencies, dear colleagues from Brussels and Berlin, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure and I feel very honored uh, to be able to welcome you here today to the Humboldt Radio for Europa with our President, Jose Manuel Barroso. We have a long-standing cooperation with the Humboldt Uni and with uh, other partners for in this series, Humboldt Radio for Europa. But for me, certainly, we've had wonderful experiences over the years, but for me today, it's a crowning experience that we have our president here to share his ideas on the future of Europe at this very critical juncture for Europe. 
If we think of Europe as an orchestra, it's one of my favorite metaphors, we've enlarged the orchestra over the years. It's become a wonderful, complex orchestra, playing complex music with harmonies and dissonances which belong to interesting music. We're probably at a time where the music could change. Uh, you mentioned Vice President uh, Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. In the last movement, there is a part where the key modulates and the music changes. Um, we need to discuss at the moment where Europe is going. Do we want to change the music? How do we want to change the music? Every great orchestra needs great conductors. And great conductors can also be composers. And we have a person of this caliber here today who is going to share his ideas on the future of Europe, where the music has come from, where it's going, how we might change it. I've seen, his, I've seen a preview of his speech and you won't be disappointed. I won't say any further because uh, he's going to share his ideas on the future of Europe with you. And I think we will all be very glad that we were here today to witness this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Duffy Horsler, Mr. President, Mr. Vice President, Excellence, Excellencies, dear colleagues from the Commission, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this first Humboldt speech on Europe this year. 2014 is called the Europa Jahr because of the European elections taking place this month, but also because the great aspirations many of us have regarding courageous progresses in the construction, or should I say, constitution of the European Union, including its economic and social cohesion and more democratic legitimacy. Today is a great moment also in the history of the Humboldt speeches on Europe. Since we opened this prestigious series of lectures at our universities in the year 2000 with the great speech of our former Chancellor Helmut Schmidt, since 14 years so, I was trying to have the President of the European Commission as our guest speaker here to share his or her views and visions on the future of Europe. This is today. Success. Thank you very much for coming. When Jose Maria Manuel Barroso took the office as the president of the European Commission almost 10 years ago in 2004, I immediately tried to convince you, Mr. President, to come to Berlin and share your visions here. Remember, 2004 was the year when the treaty establishing a constitution for Europe was signed in Rome. What an extraordinary achievement. But as we all know what happened in this, with this treaty in France and the Netherlands, we understand that at that time and period, President Barroso had suddenly other things to do than to give speeches at Humboldt. The upcoming constitutional crisis, however, was only one challenge President Barroso had to manage and did so successfully. The reform, as urgent as it was to pave the way for the accession of the big enlargement, was finally accomplished in 2009, the entry into force of the Treaty of Lisbon, the Commission's president's birthplace, Lisbon. So is it by chance that it was the Treaty of Lisbon? We know, we don't know, but it's for his honor, I guess. These days, we are celebrating 10 years of the enlarged, enlarged EU. To make a commission with 25, later 27, and then 28 commissioners function properly, was another challenge Mr. Barroso was faced with. Many commentators and even the governments were convinced that a commission with so many members could not really work. They envisaged a reduction of members of the commission 
And you know it failed because the Irish liked to have for every member state one commissioner. And so we stand also for the future. But President Barroso managed the commission so as to make it a very efficient institution in a period when effective action was badly needed for the first issue I mentioned was the constitutional crisis he managed. Second is the financial crisis. Since 2007, the European Union slipped into a financial turmoil as we have never seen since 1929. Not only the survival of the euro, but also of the whole European Union was at stake. The Barroso Commission was able to contribute enormously, if not managed alone, contributed enormously to a solution allowing us to state today that with a bit of luck the crisis is over. Bit of luck. This was not an easy task, indeed. Barroso negotiated with the IWF and the ECB, the central bank, for establishing a first umbrella for Greece. His commission initiated the EU measures to enhance the growth and stability pact and establish more intensive economic cooperation and coordination by the six pack, by the two pack, including the European semester. Together with the fiscal treaty, he now is a working, this now is a working system of economic governance for the euro, at least. And with the proposals for the banking union, as well as with the 2012 blueprint for a deep and genuine EMU, the Commission paved the way already for more stability and a more democratic, legitimate EU in the future. This third, the third issue I should mention is, of course, now the Ukrainian crisis. It, came, it started early in 2004, which was the year of the Orange Revolution, and this confronted the EU with the need to take position. In spite of certain Russian attempts to split the EU and the member state governments into different parts, Barroso helped to establish a common approach, including substantive economical and financial support to the Ukraine. This last chapter, of course, is not closed, unfortunately. And we all wonder how you, Mr. President, see the perspectives of a peaceful and stable solution to this crisis. I go a little bit far in saying perhaps we need to con reconsider our strategy and switch from sanctions to a more balanced solution and approach. But this is high politics and I do not involve in that. Ladies and gentlemen, you all know Mr. President Barroso, but do you know that he has studied law and politics, political science in Lisbon, in Florence and in New York, that he was graduated in economics and social scientist as at the Geneva University, that he served as assistant professor for international politics and undertook research in Geneva as well as at the Georgetown University. So, dear colleague, we welcome to our university to speak to our students and us, of course, and that after all this, he became a director of the Department of International Relations at the University of Porto. But, of course, Mr. Barroso already very early started a political career, even before the Portuguese Revolution in 1974. Now, he was first a leader of the Maoist party in Portugal. <laughs> Wow, but I must add, he left this party after a certain while and he turned to the Partido Social Democrata, PSD, in 1980. A conservative, rather conservative party to which he is a member up to now. His political career started in 1985 
as an understate secretary in the Ministry of the Interior. He was Portugal's foreign minister from 1992 to 1995, and he was the prime minister of Portugal from 2002 to 2004, before he was nominated and elected as the president of the European Commission in 2009, re-elected as the president of the European Commission. And I think, given his extraordinary education and career so far and experience, I think he should be re-elected a third time. <laughs> but what will bring the future? The future brings the European elections, of course. And for the first time, perhaps, with the top candidates of the party families, they recognize that the EU Commission also is a political institution and it might be politicized a little bit more. Ladies and gentlemen, before I give the floor to President Barroso, please allow me to express my gratitude to Mrs. Duffy Häusler, the acting head of the European Commission delegation in Germany. Many thanks for your excellent and very friendly cooperation in organizing this series of speeches and in particular this speech, and I add some drinks and brezeln after this event outside the door. Second to the Mercator Stiftung, Stiftung Mercator, and her representative here, Mrs. Rolvering, for the perspective of joining the cooperation team in the future of the organizing of the Humboldt speeches on Europe. Then, Mr. Janssen, thank you very much for the Deutsche Post, who also contributes to making possible this series of speeches with this strong support. And then Mrs. Müller and the other members of the WHI, Walter Hallstein Institute's team, for organizing this event today. Many thanks to all of you, and many thanks, above all, to you, dear President Barroso, for coming to Humboldt and sharing your visions with us on the future of the European Union. You have the floor. Thank you very much. I'm leaving. Mr. Vice President of the Humboldt University. Professor Kemper von den Bogart, the director of the Walter Alstein Institute, Professor Pernis, dear Marie Therese, Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, dear students. First of all, let me thank you very much for your kind invitation to be present here in this great German and European institution, the Humboldt University. I really feel the emotion of being in the University of Hegel, of Max Planck, of Albert Einstein. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to deliver this Humboldt header to Europa. I have not done it before because I thought it was appropriate to do it as a legacy speech at the end of 10 years of experience in the European Commission, and also because I was told that the students in this university are used to classes of one hour and a half. <laughs> I will try to make my speech a little bit shorter. <laughs> but I believe this is the moment, and this is the institution where I can put, in very direct terms, my experience and also my proposals for the future of Europe. I have been actively involved in the process of European integration over the last 30 years, not only for the last decade as President of the European Commission, but also as Foreign Minister and Prime Minister of my country, Portugal. I feel that it is my duty, before leaving the Office of Commission President, to share my experience and my thinking on how we can build on what we have achieved so far and go forward in the future. I feel this responsibility. Not only this responsibility, this passion, because I have indeed a passion uh, for Europe, 
And I think this is a moment to think and to decide on the future of our continent. The developments of the past 10 years, both positive and negative, have proved to be no less than spectacular. Indeed, the last decade of European integration was marked by historic achievements, starting with the enlargement since 2004 to Central and Eastern Europe and further countries in the Mediterranean. But it was also marked by unprecedented crises. First, the crisis over the impossibility to ratify the Constitutional Treaty that began in 2005 and which was only overcome with the entry into force of the Lisbon Treaty in 2009. And since 2008, the financial crash that turned into a perfect storm of a combined sovereign debt crisis, an economic crisis, and a social crisis. It was a momentous stress test for the solidity of the European Union and for the single currency, the euro, in particular. And it required exceptional measures to address it, including the creation of completely new instruments. On top of that, we are now faced with new challenges as a result of recent developments in Ukraine and Russia. Probably the biggest challenge to security and peace in Europe since the fall of the Iron Curtain and the Berlin Wall. The lessons learned throughout the last decade will give the debate on the future of the European Union a sharp perspective, which is why I wish to stimulate it with the considerations that follow. And I call them considerations on the present and the future of the European Union, because I am convinced that the European Union needs to develop further and that such a development must be an organic, not an abrupt one. Reform, not revolution. Evolution, not counter-revolution. Ladies and gentlemen, history does not move in a straight line, nice and smoothly. It twists and turns, and every now and then, it unexpectedly accelerates. We are currently living through a time of ever faster developments, and in Europe and internationally, states and other actors are struggling to cope with them. From the start, European integration was always a way to deal with such changes, a way to help states adapt to historic challenges that surpass their individual power. Yet again, events over the last decade are testimony to the extraordinary adaptability and flexibility of the European Union's institutions. One could call it their plasticity. They just, they just shape and form while keeping the substance. What then is the substance, the essence of the European project? In the first phase, you could call it Europe 1.0. Devised after the Second World War, the European project was about safeguarding peace and prosperity in the free part of Europe through economic integration and based on Franco-German reconciliation. Redesigned after the fall of the Iron Curtain and the Berlin Wall, Europe 2.0, if you can call it like that, was focused on extending the benefits of open markets and open societies to an enlarged, reunited Europe. With the fallout from financial economic crisis and the emergence of the multipolar world of globalization, the third phase of European integration set in. We now need to update to what we could call Europe 3.0. Each step in this process has led to a European Union that was more interactive, more complex, and had a more profound impact. Because the challenges were greater, more difficult to grasp and call for more elaborate forms of cooperation. Now, the third phase is mainly, or should mainly be, about the power and influence required to safeguard Europe's peace and prosperity under the conditions of globalization. The economic and financial crisis showed, particularly, that the improvement of the governance of the euro area was indispensable for the long-term sustainability of a single currency. Further institutional steps of a more political nature may become indispensable. The challenge is, of course, how to make them in a way that keeps the integrity of the internal market and of our union as a whole. A multiple-speed reinforced cooperation in Europe may become a necessity, 
But the Europe of multiple classes has been and must always be avoided at all costs. So, flexibility, yes. Certification, no. Before going more in detail on these institutional challenges, and namely the issue of Europe's power and influence in the world, let us not forget that the main objective since the creation of European communities, peace and prosperity, are still of essence for us today. Recent developments confirm it. Peace and stability, because the very real threats to the economic foundations of Europe ended up undermining our self-confidence and led to an almost surreal and self-fulfilling panic, endangering the very fabric of European unity. The potential unraveling of the euro was seen as the start of the unraveling of Europe. Had it materialized, it would undoubtedly have divided Europe once again into first and second classes economies and hence societies. And it certainly would have ended the vision of a continent of equals united in an ever closer union. Now, frictions between North and South, between rich and poor, between debtor and creditor countries, between the center and the periphery have indeed come up. But we have not allowed them to fragment Europe. On the contrary, we are more than ever in recent history on the road to deepening our economic and monetary union, whilst fully upholding the principles that have preserved the integrity of the European Union at large. Indeed, the European Union institutions, from the European Commission to the Central Bank, saw their competences and power reinforced. Some of these competences will be unimaginable some years ago before the crisis. Indeed, the European level gained in relevance. Concerning the economic substance, it was the biggest institutional transformation since the creation of the euro. And those who said <clears throat> that the peace motive for European integration was a thing of the past need only Look at Ukraine. Peace is never given, an absolute certainty. Peace needs to be won over and over again through the generations, through European unity, through united European actions in the United, in the wider region, and internationally. The idea of peace is as compelling as ever for the European integration. And prosperity, which has made the European Union so attractive since the beginning of European integration, has also been challenged in the financial and economic crisis. This was a crisis of growth models, unmasking attempts to inflate economic growth through financial wizardry and to sustain growth through public or private debt, as was being tried in, respectively, the American and European economies. Now we are back to doing it the hard way, through innovation and structural reforms for global competitiveness. The worst hit countries are hitting back remarkably. Ireland, Spain, and Portugal have been making notable progress. Just this week, my country, Portugal, announced that they will exit the program without requesting further assistance from the European Union. In spite of all difficulties, Greece and Cyprus are also on the right path. Contrary to many predictions, not only nobody leave the Eurozone, but Latvia, after impressive efforts, was able to join. And European countries are applying the lessons drawn from the crisis in terms of debt and economic, macroeconomic imbalances. Economies are reforming, even if some, including larger ones, need to speed up delivery. And these efforts are no longer individual, but increasingly attuned to the policies and effects seen across borders. Europe needs such legitimation by results, and this can only come from a continued emphasis on innovation and reform. Reform of our economic structures, of public administrations, of labor markets, of the internal market, of energy and climate policies, and so on. Delivering these results is part of our necessary communality. Of course, some of those adjustments were extremely um, painful. And we have seen the situation of social emergency in some of our uh, countries. But it is important also to note that with or without the euro, with or without the European Union, those adjustments will have to happen anyhow. 
and that it was not the cause. The Euro or the European Union were not the cause of the difficulties. In fact, Europe was not the cause of the problem. Europe is part of the solution. The European social market economy is based on a unique social mo model. Even with national variations, our welfare state differentiates us from all other major economies and societies, from developed to emerging economies. It is precious for citizens, a model that embodies the values they adhere to, the unique combination of responsibility for oneself and solidarity with society and across generations, a model that delivers the goals they live up to, such as security in old age and in adversity. And it is only through cooperation and adaptation that will safeguard our social market economy. Returning now to the main issue of what we have called the third phase of European integration, that of influence and power, we have to recognize that to safeguard peace and prosperity in Europe, we need a European Union that is much more willing to project that power and influence in the world. During the crisis, confidence in Europe's global influence was severely impaired internationally. The global attractiveness of Europe's economic model was temporarily undercut. And with that, our values and our authority as a global player were put in doubt. Now we need to fight back and regain our role and influence. The challenge of globalization is much broader than economics. Our diplomatic approach needs rethinking. Our defense capacities need to be pooled. Our values need to be upheld more than ever. The world system is adapting itself as well, forging a new world order. Either we contribute to reshaping it or we miss out on the future. Here, too, the developments around Ukraine show the need for us to be vigilant and the imperative of being united. Either Europe will advance in its coherence and willingness to project its power and influence, or it will face irrelevance. This demands us to make the internal state of the European Union more stable. We need to address the three gaps. There is a governance gap. Since member states on their own no longer have what it takes to deliver what citizens need. While the European institutions still lack part of the equipment to do so. There is a legitimacy gap. Because citizens perceive that decisions are taken at a level too distant from them. And there is an expectations gap. Because people expect more than the political system can actually deliver. And since there is no automaticity for member states to agree the tools to repair these gaps at the European level, there is a clear need to define the communality we want, on which depends our role in the world. Stability will only come from a newfound balance at a higher level of communality. Ladies and gentlemen, no one ever said, however, that adjustment was easy even if it is undeniable necessary. Profound change is particularly challenging for European countries, which, being democracies, have to think not only about what they need to do, but also about how to do it. Complying with new realities is not enough. We need to embrace new realities with conviction and offer reassurance that they are to everyone's benefit. I remember listening to prime ministers in European Council meetings saying, we know what we have to do. The only problem is that if we do it, we will lose the next elections. This cannot be an excuse to not to do the necessary, not to do the hard work of conviction. Rendre possible ce qui est nécessaire, to make possible what is necessary, is the condition for a responsible government. This is not a test for the European Union only. Governments all across the world in different ways, are facing similar challenges. Democracy is once again proving to be the best, most stable way of dealing with them. And yet, at the same time, democracy, more than any other system, demands statesmanship and courageous leadership. The drive for earlier phases of European integration, contrary to the perception popular in some quarters, has always come from the bottom up as well as from the top down. 
This was the case for the resistance movements, trade unions, and entrepreneurs who came together after the horrors of the war. This was the case for the young Germans and French eager to cross mental and actual borders in the 1950s. This was the case for the Greek, Portuguese, and Spanish who in the 70s freed themselves from dictatorships to feel as part of Europe, who saw that the regimes in which they lived were unable and unwilling to adapt while the world turned without them. This was the case for the Central and the Eastern Europeans, from Solidarnosc in Poland to the Velvet Revolution in Prague, from the Baltic independence movements to the Hungarians who first opened the Iron Curtain in the 80s and 90s. They saw regaining democracy as to a large extent equivalent to belonging to the European Union. My generation felt that in Portugal. The same was later felt by generations in the central and east part of Europe. They knew that in Vaclav Havel's words, words, Europe is the homeland of our homeland. Speaking in London in 1951, Konrad Adenauer described what made Germany such a determined actor in European integration's early phases. I quote, it is not the fear of Bolshevism alone which moves us, but also the recognition that the problems we have to face in our time, namely the preservation of peace and defense of freedom, can only be solved inside that larger community. This conviction is shared by the broad masses in Germany. I may point out in this connection that the German Bundestag on July 26, 1950, pronounced itself unanimously in favor of the creation of a European Federation. End of quote. Germany, 1950. Konrad Adenauer. Today, such broad-based political and societal support is as vital as ever. We cannot move forward without momentum. We cannot and should not force public opinion's hand. But we can try and forge the consensus we need. Here comes the issue of political leadership. Leadership is about taking responsibility. Leadership is not about following the popular or populist trends. Because the European Union is not what it used to be. It has matured into an ever fuller democratic system of governance, notably through the Lisbon Treaty, and one whose impact on people's lives goes far beyond earlier versions. Indeed, we have been building the most, much closer union that before was only an aspiration. As a result, mere bureaucratic, technocratic, and diplomatic deliberation will no longer do. Even symmetry has reached its limits. We need a new debate, a new dialogue to take this further. A real sense of ownership of the European project, both at the national and transnational level. This is really the heart of the matter. Policy and polity can only function if there is a consensus on the commonality agreed on the way to get there. The sui generis work in progress character of the European project is reflected in a series of treaty discussions since Maastricht that have dominated the debate. Since then, the financial and economic crisis has again raised a series of treaty questions. The constitutional question for Europe has not been laid to rest. I would argue that it is not even answerable in a definitive way, and certainly not now. Those who adhere to the ultra-integrationist prayer of them cannot ignore that the vast majority of people do not want European unity to the detriment of the nation state. Those who have a purely national or intergovernmental perspective cannot ignore that nation states on their own no longer suffice to offer citizens what they expect. Trying to identify a conceptual endpoint to European integration, one way or another, is pointless. The sensible course is a different one. At each phase, European integration was based on a clear sense of purpose, a clear idea of the need for Europe. 
The means to do so, the treaties and institutions have always followed the political will. So now, before we discuss the technical details of yet another treaty, we must answer the question, what kind of commonality do we acknowledge as necessary, indispensable, unavoidable between capitals and Brussels? What do we recognize as things we must decide to do together, no matter what? What is the agreed, settled, joint purpose of our union? To what extent do we join our destinies, irrevocably and without reserve? In short, what is our vision? The crisis signaled an end to the era of implicit consensus, the quasi-intuitive nature of European integration. Now the consensus needs to be made explicit. Now is the time to have a political and societal debate on what commonality we want in the European Union, on how far and how deep we want integration to go, on who wants to participate in what and for what purpose. Ladies and gentlemen, let me outline the politics, the principles and the policy areas I believe we need to put at the center of our efforts to build such a consensus. In April 1978, Roy Jenkins, then President of the European Commission, found himself in a position I would come to know all too well myself decades later. He said, the economics of the community involves jobs and declining industries, monetary stability, regional policy, energy options. All these are the stuff of politics, not of bureaucracy. And although he seemed to be stating the obvious, he drew an interesting conclusion, and I quote, although there may be some who believe to the contrary, the institutions of the community have been carefully constructed and indeed adapted over time to allow for the interplay of argument and its resolution at both technical and political level. They are not perfect, but the framework for decision is there. End of quote. Indeed, the temptation very often was, and still is, to put the discussion on the framework for decision before what Roy Jenkins called the stuff of politics. All too often, European debates on policies are waged merely in institutional or constitutional terms. An obsession with polity has led attention away from the policies and politics they needed. Instead of making decisions, we discuss how to make decisions and who gets to make them. I would warn against that today, just like Jenkins did four decades ago. The challenges of ahead of us in this third phase of European integration must be examined from the f point of view of first, the politics needed. Second, the policies needed. And third, the polity needed to achieve the first two, and in that order. So debate on the future of Europe must be first and foremost a debate on politics and policies, not one on institutions and treaties. It must be a debate on what we want to do together and why. Without a consensus on this, we can debate endlessly about subsidiarity clauses and opt-outs without convincing or satisfying anyone. We must decide individually and collectively what we want to do together and what we do not need or do not want to do together. The framework for decision in the European Union has evolved tremendously over the years, not just since Jenkins' time, but even in my day. If you compare where we were 20 years ago with where we are today, the evolution is striking. And I do not mean only in terms of competences, but mainly in the modes and dynamics of the decision-making process. I have the privilege to participate in council meetings since 1987. And in the European Council from 1992 to 1995. And I can testify that these differences are very important. In some cases, the very culture of the institutions went through fundamental changes. At the beginning of the 90s, the European community was still centered around the Council. True, the Commission had the right of initiative, but most decision powers were with the member states. Since then, our system and process have changed decisively. Above all, 
through the increase in the power of the European Parliament away from a consultative assembly to the indispensable co-legislator. Even if the Parliament itself still often hesitates between its rôle tribunicien as opposed to its rôle décisionnel, the temptation to demand without regard for feasibility, namely the underestimation of the political conditions for some decisions, is not fully overcome by all players in the European Parliament. And we have seen that some prefer a function of protest or even anti-establishment rather than a role more in line with the needs to achieve pragmatic results with the other institutions. Probably this also happens because the Parliament lacks its own right of initiative. But we should recognize that broadly, the contribution of the Parliament has been constructive. In the end, throughout the last decade, the Parliament has played for high stakes, but ultimately, it has played the game, from the adoption of the European Union's budget to the conclusion of the banking union. The relations among member states are also very different as a result of the different dynamics between 28 now as compared to 12 in 1992, for instance. 1994, for instance, because we can compare the last 20 years. Contrary to the Brussels myth, this is not so much a question of size and might. It is a question of vision and agenda. I can compare the dynamics of the European Council in 1992 or 1994, where when we were 12 members, and when foreign ministers uh, participated in those meetings, and today. I remember well uh, Almut Kohl, uh, François Mitterrand, uh, Felipe Gonzalez on those meetings. And so I can establish the difference of the dynamics of those European councils on those of today. There are governments that come to the table with a defensive view, others with a single issue, still others without a burning interest. Only a few leaders come with an all-encompassing view, a comprehensive approach. They feel some responsibility for Europe, but not all feel the same level of responsibility. And it is this responsibility what gives the hedge in a political process like the European Union. Accordingly, the center of gravity on the Council side has also greatly changed. Once, the treaty concept saw the General Affairs Council composed by the Foreign Affairs Ministers as the political pinnacle of the, si of the side of the Council. This has completely shifted to the European Council. Europe has become a chef Sache. The body that brings the national chiefs together, the European Council, has been gaining importance even before the Lisbon Treaty made it more operational and stable by the creation of the office of its permanent president. True, some of its dynamics are due to the specificity of the economic and financial crisis. The need to mobilize rapidly financial means that only the member states could command. This may abate over time. But heads of state and government will need to see their role not only as national, but at the same time as European. The shift from the Council to the European Council has, however, brought with it a certain implementation gap. For instance, the initial voluntarism of repeated demands for European Councils or Euro Area Summits for each and every new development that led to a succession of summits had the advantage of putting pressures on leaders to decide. But it also trivialized the summits and deepened the sense that decisions were always too little and that implementation was always too late. Because often, decisions taken by heads of state and government were not really followed through at national level. There was an excess of pressure and a lack of precision. The Commission emerged from all of this as the indispensable and reinforced focal point. Its right of initiative was always maintained throughout the crisis. Or may I, may I say, its talent for initiative, as initiated by Walter Alstein and developed by Jacques Delors, was present throughout the crisis 
and was indeed at the origin of these decisive concepts. From the creation of the EFSM, the FSF, and later the European Stability Mechanism, the ESM, which were ultimately based on the Commission proposals, to the banking union, from the initiative to launch project bonds, to the Commission legislative proposals on the reform of the economic governance, including a new stability and growth pact. The Commission has always followed a truly European approach in the exercise of its right of initiative. Interestingly, there is no better illustration of the inevitability of the Commission's role than the Intergovernmental Fiscal Treaty. Throughout its negotiation, the Commission was an indispensable source of expertise and creative legislative technique around the table. And in the end, even in this context, the intergovernmental one, it was the Commission that came to the forefront when strong implementation had to be guaranteed. The fact the Commission, in order to obtain results, is sometimes capable of not claiming all the glory for itself, should not be confounded with a fading role. There is no other place in the Union that brings together the horizontal view, awareness of the plurality of member state situations, with the vertical insight, the expertise of European policies. But in order to understand fully what has happened between then and now, one must also look at media scrutiny. It has become deeper, faster, much more comprehensive and critical. No more reverence to summits and to leaders. Success is measured by results, by immediate results. If they do not stand up to media dissection, they melt away, as happened once or twice very publicly throughout the crisis. This also explains to a point the stuttering process, the syncopated nature of the crisis response. And this is one of the reasons why the building of the European Union has been compared to scaffolding it appears as something that is in permanent construction and repair. But the scaffolding very often hides the beauty of the construction behind it. Indeed, I would suggest that it is in the very nature of the European project to resemble permanent work in progress. And those who are concerned with the lack of coherence, the lack of symmetry, will do better to adapt to an architectural concept that to achieve new functions has to develop new shapes and new designs. In the European Union, l'esprit system usually does not work very well. We can say that the integration process has passed the test of time and the stress of crisis because there was always an obligation de résultat that was matched with effective results. We have developed an art of governance to a degree of maturity that allows us to reach decisions based on a broad consensus. What we have seen, and what we see above all, is that leadership matters. Because only leadership by building consensus avoids fragmentation. This is why I have made sure that the commissions I presided took collective responsibilities for their decisions. The president of the commission is the guarantor of collegiality which avoids the silo mentality and tunnel vision. As a rule, in the Commission, we started with sincerely held differences of opinion and real debates. But almost all decisions in these 10 years were ultimately taken by consensus. A political executive is not a miniature parliament. And as an executive, the Commission must take responsibility for the initiatives it collectively deems necessary. That is why, according to the treaties, the decision-making in the Commission is collegiate rather than individual. It is possible for a college with 28 members to work. Above all, it is a question of a true community culture and an efficient management of the institution. Since the beginning of my first Commission, almost coincided with the biggest enlargement ever of the European Union in 2004, I was particularly aware of the need to avoid its fragmentation along geographical, ideological, or other lines. I firmly believe that whilst it is important to recognize the political character of the Commission, it is equally important to avoid giving the Commission a partisan nature. The Commission does not only have political functions, but also administrative 
and what I call quasi-jurisdictional functions. This requires great wisdom and balance at decision-making level so that the credibility of the Commission in its different roles is not undermined and that its independence and professionalism are not endangered. The European Union has moved in the last two decades to a much greater, greater level of political and institutional maturity. And it is in this political framework that we could solve the crisis. But what we have today needs consolidation, if it is to endure. Consolidation. It is the manner in which we consolidate and advance that should be discussed today. Because this debate is a precondition for what we need to achieve. And what we need to achieve? We need to achieve growth and employment through the further shaping of our internal market and of our common currency, our trade, our energy and climate, our science and innovation, our infrastructure, our industry, our digital uh, economy policies. What we need to achieve? We need to achieve freedom and security through our common foreign and security policy and our common justice and home affairs. What we need to achieve? We need our social well-being through our joint efforts in education, culture, youth, and addressing the common challenges of our demography and social security systems. Ladies and gentlemen, if the framework for decision is there, we must also acknowledge a number of dysfunctionalities within European politics that impair our capacity to put it to use. This is a real problem for Europe's democracy. There is a lack of ownership in European politics, which institutional adjustments by themselves cannot remedy. When democratic decision makers refuse to acknowledge, defend, and endorse their common decisions, European legitimacy will always suffer. All too often, political controversies are seen as systemic deficiencies. Rather than confining a debate to the subject matter, is there a better solution, say, to the light bulb or the olive oil can issue? Controversial outcomes are presented as the inevitable absurd result of a flawed Brussels system. This despite the fact that both the debates and the results will be similar, if not identical, if held at the national level. It is not just Brussels centralism that causes regulation on health issues, product standards, worker rights, uh, environmental rules, or transport safety in the first place. But the societal debate and citizens' calls for action to meet their concerns. As a rule, regulatory initiatives do not start in Brussels. They start with societal, business, or workers' interests, with public debates and political processes. For instance, the idea to regulate the light bulbs and olive oil cans were national ideas. In fact, we took uh, forward the light bulb because energy efficiency makes sense. But we have stopped the initiative of regulating the olive oil cans because, because we believe it does not need a European uh, solution. There is also an asymmetry between the national political dialectics and the European ones. At the national level, there is a government versus opposition logic so that every issue as a party against, as well as a party in favor. In Europe, there is no such logic, and hence, no party in favor of everything that Europe does. It is mainly the Commission, which is conceived by the treaties to be the defender of the general European interest, that is always expected to stand for the collective decisions agreed. But the Commission is all too often left without effective support by a system where everybody else can afford to be a little bit in government and a little bit in opposition. This means that there is cognitive dissonance between the political processes at the national and European levels, which in turn makes for the emergence of almost schizophrenic political behavior. At European level, national politicians can ask for much more than at home without needing to take responsibility for subsequent adoption and implementation. The temptations and opportunities to shirk responsibility are manifold 
and I could tell you from my experience, it's common to see the same party saying one thing in their capital and completely the opposite, not just different, the opposite in the European Parliament in Strasbourg. And in the end, the political sanction for all actors, be they national or European, is still in the national electoral dynamics. There is not a real pan-European political sanction detached from the national level, disposed on its own merits. Ultimately, the problem is this. All countries would like to see Europe as a big screen projection of their own aspirations, and are ready to say that Europe has a problem when the others not follow their initiatives. Many member states hope or pretend Europe will eventually be a bigger version of themselves, but that will never be the case. Similarly, many politicians like their own pet micro-regulation whilst decrying others doing the same as unjustified meddling. Nothing has done our union more harm than the tendency of those who fail to convince to blame their lack of success on deficiencies of Europe rather than on their inability to win a majority for their ideas. And this in turn leads us into the stark dilemma that is at the heart of discussion on the future. When the people do not like a national decision, they usually vote against the decision maker. If they do not like European decision, they tend to turn to Europe itself. The political issue is indeed the first one that must be addressed. So if I get the question, so what's the problem? I would say it's the politics, stupid. In a nation state, in a nation state, the legitimacy issue is in principle solved. Policy disagreement does not normally turn into a challenge to the polity, to the political system. But in the European Union, legitimacy still depends on delivery of concrete results. This explains why, while the lack of support to national institutions or political parties does in general not become a threat to national unity, the lack of support to union institutions may become a threat to European integration itself. In fact, any political project needs a minimum of sustained support, be it explicit or implicit. Beyond the general doubt or angst of common citizens regarding their perceptions of most institutions and elites in the age of globalization, the specific challenge that the European Union has been facing recently is this. Confronting, confronted with the growing voices of euroscepticism and even europhobia, some mainstream political forces have internalized populist arguments rather than countering them. From the center left to the center right, political forces and actors must leave their comfort zone, I would say. Instead of abandoning the debate to the extremes, they have to recover the initiative. They have to make the case for a positive agenda for Europe, both at national and union level. And no treaty change, no institutional engineering can replace the political will for Europe. I am heartened by the fact that this idea is making headway already. As Friedrich Oederlin once said, wo die Gefahr ist, wächst das rettenden Hauch. Such political handicaps need to be addressed above all in order to reinforce both the legitimacy and the effectiveness of Europe. To remedy this, we need leadership, action, and ownership for and of the European Union's project, understood as part of the political and societal fabric of its member states. We need to understand that European policy is no longer foreign policy. European policy is internal policy today in all our member states. We need to develop a new relationship of cooperation. A cooperation Verhältnis between the Union, its institutions, and the Member States. By cooperative relationship, I mean a principle whereby the institutional Member States go beyond the law of cooperation already in China in the treaties, notably Article 4 of the Treaty of the European Union, and work in a way that maximizes compatibility of decisions taken at different levels. For too long, the expectation, at least in the Brussels bubble, was that European institutions would always try to do more than the treaties allowed them, while the expectation with the Indian member states was that they would push back to make them do less. 
This immature behavior has to be overcome. What we need is a mature handling of clear mandates to the different actors and levels of our union, from the local to the regional, to the national, to the European sphere. Mandates that are respected fully, both in their extension, their limits, by all. And to move from a competitive to a cooperative approach between the union's institutions and between the European institutions and the member states, we need a reinforced role of political parties at union's level, to aggregate political interests, to structure political priorities, to ensure political coherence throughout. This is why the electoral dynamics triggered by the nomination of Spitzenkandidaten of the political parties for the office of commission president can be a step in the right direction. While acknowledging the limits of the current exercise, I believe that it may reinforce the European nature of these elections. It is a way to help the parties who want to take it up to progressively shape, give shape to European public sphere. It is strange, or maybe not, that political forces that have always criticized the lack of democratic accountability in Europe now reject such new measures that are designed precisely to strengthen that accountability. For sure, national democracy is indispensable for the legitimacy of the European Union. But we will be wrong to hamper the progress of European democracy in its own right. This is still a system in the making, certainly but trying to block it would only set us back. These dynamics must be followed by a pause electoral understanding, not only on personalities, but also on political priorities, not only within each institution, but also between institutions. On a more concrete level, this means an agreement between the Parliament, the Council, and the Commission for the priorities, positive and negative, of a new legislature. This could also be followed by a new interinstitutional agreement on better regulation, so as to limit excessive administrative burden. Otherwise, there will never be a convincing and compelling agreement on the issues about which the union needs to be big and the issues about which the union should remain small. Ladies and gentlemen, it is on, the basis, on this basis that more than the unavoidable surgical adaptations to the union's current legal framework can be done. In the foreseeable future, I believe there will not be a European Philadelphia moment, the creation of a constitution from scratch. The Union's way of developing will continue to be permanent reform rather than permanent revolution. For this permanent reform to succeed and for each step to be in line with the overall vision behind it, there are a number of principles I believe need to be respected. First, any further development of the Union should be based on the existing treaties and on the community method since moving outside this framework would lead to fragmentation, overlapping of structures, and ultimately to incoherence and, or, and underperformance. Second, a cleanup of the existing overcomplexities and contradictions within the treaties and between the treaties and other instruments should precede further additions. additions. Crucially, this means that intergovernmental devices like the European Stability Mechanism and the Fiscal Treaty should be integrated into the treaties as soon as possible. Third, any new intergovernmental solutions should be considered on an exceptional and transitional basis only in order to avoid accountability and coherence problems. Fourth, the Union should always aim at evolving as much as possible as a whole with 28 member states today. Where deeper integration in other formations in, is indispensable, namely the present and the future members of the single currency, it should remain open to all those who are willing to participate. The method of choice for closer integration among a group of member states is reinforced cooperation, as provided for by the treaties. Fifth, any further development of the Union should be based on a clear phasing and sequencing with future moves constructed primarily through the use of all possibilities offered by the treaties as they stand, without reserves not foreseen by these treaties, so that treaty change must only be embraced where secondary legislation is not provided for by the treaties. And six, the pace of development must not be dictated by the most reticent. The speed of Europe must not be the one of the slowest. And seventh, when another treaty change is deemed necessary, the case for it must be fully argued and debated, including the public sphere, 
before it is negotiated and put up for ratification. At this stage, it is of course true that we are faced with a particular challenge when it comes to the relationship between the single currency, the euro area, and the European Union as a whole. But I believe that the logic of the treaties offers useful guidance in this respect. According to the treaties, the single currency is meant for all member states except for those who have a permanent opt-out. And the truth is there is only one member state, the UK, that has such an opt-out. Even Denmark's status is better described as a possible opt-in than as a permanent opt-out. All the others have committed to join the euro. This will take time and certainly even more thorough preparation than in the past. But it will be a mistake to develop a logic of convergence into a structure of divergence, more so since the practical experience during the development of the crisis response has shown that the fault lines in discussions do not lie between the present and future members of the euro. From the euro plus pact to the fiscal compact, from the single supervisory mechanism to the single resolution mechanism, whenever the 17 or 18 embarked on a more ambitious project, almost all of the others joined and contributed. Indeed, the centripetal forces have proved to be stronger than the centrifugal ones. The tendency of some to dream about the refoundation of the Union through a more limited, smaller euro area than the European Union of 28 is not a response to systemic deficiencies or a lack of potential among the 28. It is the expression of a nostalgia for a cozy arrangement, for a return of the mistakenly so perceived comfort of the smaller, less difficult, and supposedly more coherent times of more intimate integration. But time waits for no one. And history has moved on, playing whatever Kern Europa against whatever periphery will weaken both. Here is maybe the moment to make a comment on the relationship between the European Union and the United Kingdom. I passionately believe that Europe is stronger in the UK as its member, and that UK is stronger as a member of the European Union than on its own. But I do acknowledge that for historical, geopolitical, economic reasons, the case of the UK may be seen as a special one. Precisely because of this, it will be a mistake to transform an exception for the UK into a rule for everybody else. We can and should find ways to cater to the UK specificity inasmuch as this does not threaten the Union's overall coherence. But we should not confound this specificity, even if in some issues is shared at some moments by several governments, with an overall situation of the Union. Ladies and gentlemen, based on these principles, a number of policy fields stand out that particularly demand debate, action and decision on concrete institutional improvements in the years to come. First, the deepening of the Economic and Monetary Union, in line with the Commission's blueprint. Second, more effective external representation to the union, of the Union. Third, strengthening of union values and citizenship. Fourth, a better regulatory division of labor. And fifth, the need to perfect our political union. For the deepening of the Economic and Monetary Union, the Commission's blueprint for a deep and genuine economic and monetary union remains the valid vision. It combines substantial ambition with appropriate sequencing. First, the reformed economic governance needs to be fully implemented. Once this has been achieved, the gradual development of a fiscal capacity at the level of the euro area, complemented by additional coordination of tax policy and labor markets, should be contemplated. Such a development, which will ultimately require treaty changes, must be accompanied by commensurate democratic legitimacy and accountability. A more fiscal federal approach within the euro area must involve not only the present members of the single currency, it must remain open to all future and potential members and respect the integrity of the single market and of the policies conducted by the Union as a whole. More effective external representation requires a cooperative division of labor between the Union's and member states' office holders. The present track record of cooperation between the presence of the European Council of the Commission provides useful guidance in this respect. The High Representative, Vice President of the Commission, must be provided with effective political deputies from both the Commission and the Council. The potential of joint external representation as foreseen in the Lisbon Treaty must be used to the full. The combination of foreign policy with external aspects of internal policies provides the Union with leverage in the world. 
It allows for a more efficient burden sharing between the Union and its member states. Crucially, the first steps towards a more joined up security and defense policy must be followed up. And very relevantly, the achievement of a more coherent external representation of the euro area in international financial institutions is also part of that effort. The strengthening of the Union's values and citizenship requires the full respect and implementation of the rule of law and the Union's rights, guarantees, and freedoms. Instruments like the fundamental right checks in legislative impact assessments and the Commission's safeguard of the rule of law framework need to be safeguarded and consolidated. The fight against abuse of Union rights, notably the right to free movement, can and must be addressed through secondary legislation not through questioning the principle. And regarding the regulatory division of labor, the starting point must be the recognition that union member states are not less regulated than the union itself. Whilst there are undoubtedly cases of institutional overzeal, including on the side of the commission, one must not lose sight of the fact that the real driver of union regulation is the need to make the detailed regulation of 28 member states compatible with each other. The question of how to be big on big things and smaller on smaller things either is therefore not so much one of negative or positive lists for fields of action, but rather the intensity and intrusiveness of specific initiatives. This is best addressed through a new interinstitutional agreement on better lawmaking that will extend the regulatory fitness check, impact assessment, and bureaucratization measures already taken by the Commission throughout the whole legislative process. Ultimately, it is a question of a periodical review of the political consensus on political priorities, which could be helped by the introduction of sunset clauses or a principle of legislative discontinuity at the change of European Parliament. And regarding the need to perfect our political union and enhance the democratic legitimacy that should underpin what I call Europe 3.0, it should be based on the community method as a system of checks, balances, and equity between the institutions and the member states that offers the best starting point for further supranational democracy. Such supranational democracy must not be constructed as a multi-level combination of vetoes, but rather as a system of accountability at the level where executive decisions are taken. In as much as executive decisions are taken by European executives, notably the Commission, it is the European legislature, hence the European Parliament, and in its legislative functions, the Council that need to ensure democratic legitimacy and accountability. Conversely, it falls to national parliaments to ensure the legitimacy and accountability of decisions taken at the level of member states, including the action of member states in the Council. The relations between national parliaments and European Parliament should also be a privileged part of the cooperationsverhältnis that I've been advocating. It is in this logic that the future development should go in the direction of constituting a reform commission as the Union's executive, including the Union's treasury function. It will be responsible to a bicameral legislature composed of the European Parliament and the Council as the two chambers. In order to ensure the right balance between the political creation and the functional independence of the commission, the present way of negative censure for the commission should be replaced by a mechanism of constructive censor, whereby the European Commission only falls in case uh, the absolute majority of the European Parliament proposes another president for the European Commission. And finally, in order to ensure full coherence and efficiency between the different executive roles at Union's level, as well as their democratic legitimacy and accountability, further innovations can be considered. In the medium term, the office of the Vice President of the Commission responsible for economic and monetary affairs and the euro could be merged with the Office of the President of the Eurogroup. A more radical innovation, such as merging the Office of the President of the European Commission with the Office of the President of the European Council, would undoubtedly be a question for the longer term. But with the probable evolution of European integration, namely in the Euro area, this merger makes sense, because it will reinforce the coherence and visibility of the European Union's political system, internally and externally. Some transitional phases and intermediate solutions are also possible. What is important to note, however, is that these institutional developments can only be successful if the indispensable progress on the politics and the convergence of policies are achieved first, 
once again, it's the politics of it. It's the politics that makes uh, it possible or not afterwards follow on the institutional developments and not the contrary. Ladies and gentlemen, let me conclude. European integration will always be a step-by-step -step process. We knew that from the start. L'Europe ne se fera pas d'un coup ni dans une construction d'ensemble. Schumann Declaration. Such a pragmatic approach has never been in contradiction with working towards a vision, our ambition, our dream. What a, a German philosopher called a lucid dream, as Stoldijk. It remains, the European Union remains the most visionary project in recent history. Its energy and attraction is striking. Its adaptability is unprecedented. But only if certain conditions are met. When leadership is ambiguous, when cooperation reaches new levels of maturity, and when the politics of Europe are on the offensive. That's what's at stake in the coming European elections. They are the best possible moment to stand up for what has been achieved and to build a consensus around what that needs to be done. To speak up for Europe as it really is and advocate a vision of what Europe could be. These elections matter a great deal. In 10 years at the end of the European Commission, I have tried to add to the foundations of a pragmatic, coherent and resilient European Union. While the European Union response may not always have stood up to its initial ambition, I believe that the Commission has played and will continue to play an essential role. We have worked to preserve Europe's unity, to keep it open and make it stronger. Stronger because the economies of member states are becoming more competitive to face global competition. And stronger because at European level, our economic and financial governance has been spectacularly reinforced. There is a lot to build on from here. A unique project, a necessary project, a project that we should be proud of. I have had the privilege to be there to contribute to the response to some of the most threatening events in the European Union's history, and honored to be able to initiate reforms based on lessons learned from that experience. But the true reward for all those involved will come not from starting, but from finishing the efforts necessary. So now let us work further. Let us undertake la réforme de tous les jours. Let us continue the work with what one of my predecessors, François Xavier Ortoli, called the courage de chaque jour. And uh, for those like me, and I hope like you, that share this passion, this love for Europe, let's do it with the aim of creating the conditions to leave everybody in Europe a decent society. Because at the end, this is not about concepts, it's not about figures, it's not about economics, it's about value. And I believe in Europe that precisely stands for the values of peace, of freedom and solidarity. I thank you for your attention. Thank you.